Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Champions of Marketing. On this episode, I have a good friend of mine, Gerardo Contreras, who is a marketing and product strategy expert and also happens to be a new dad. So, Gerardo, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for the invite, Chris. And you'll probably hear a little one screaming on the back, so I apologize for that. But you know how it is these days, mm-hmm. everyone at no, home. Not a problem. <laughs> uh, so let's uh, let's get right into it, Gerardo. We um, we had a little chat offline before, and, and I'm really um, looking forward to our conversation today. So I wanted to start off with with the obvious. We're recording this on May the 14th, 2020, in the midst of of COVID 19 global pandemic. It's no secret that COVID has had a pretty big impact on many small to mid sized businesses. Um, you're based in Australia. You're originally from Colombia, so you've got a lot of global experience. Um, can you just talk to me a bit about your situation um, recently with COVID and, and just how things have panned out for you in the last couple of months? Yeah, absolutely. So um, maybe I'll, I'll start with a little intro of what I've done and uh, background of kind of my experience to to set the scene. So we met when I was working at Adobe a few years back. Um, I have lots of experience working with enterprise uh, SaaS companies. Um, and uh, after spending four years at Adobe, I moved to Google. After Google, I moved to MindBody, which is a, for everyone who doesn't know the, the brand, it's a, a SaaS company that um, sells, sells software for the fitness and wellness industry. Um, when COVID-19 hit, um, everything was going really smoothly. Uh, MindBody was in the period of growing internationally. So they were acquired by a company called Vista Equity Partner in the end of 2018. So this is uh, the same company that bought Marketo and sold it to Adobe yep. back in 2017, if I'm not wrong. Um, so they were private. Uh, sorry, they were Public, they came. They came to Vista, came private, and Vista injected a lot of cash into making the company global. So very, very big company in the U.S. And I was actually one of the first hires, marketing hires outside the U.S. So I joined the company uh, in 2019 with the idea of starting a whole marketing function in Asia Pacific. And things were going great. The the business was growing. Um, as many companies uh, understand today, APAC is a massive uh, area of growth. Uh, the company understood that. They were investing heavily. And then in February, we started seeing the effects of COVID. Uh, I got to the point where I was already, I had people hired for my team. Um, we had a plan set up for 2020. And unfortunately, the crisis arrived. And in a matter of weeks, uh, the company had to scale down, stop investing in international growth, and they laid off 700 people globally, uh, included myself and my team. Um, you know, when things like this happen, companies tend to stop marketing investment. That's one of the first things that they cut. And unfortunately, myself and my team were affected by this. Um, so that's, that's what, where, where we are at the moment. And I know we're going to have a, a little bit of conversation about what this means and how can brands mm-hmm. uh, adapt to the situations and what marketing uh, can do when things hit, um, uh, when the crisis like this arrives. So that's kind of where I am at the moment. And, um, I've decided to take some time off and work on a personal, uh, business that I've been uh, that I've had in mind for, for months. So that's what I'm spending my time at the moment and, you know, just spending time with family. Awesome. Good, good to hear, man. You're, uh, you're always passionate and you're always, you know, very optimistic and I love to see it. Uh, Mind Body is, is an app that I'd used in the past to book yoga classes and a bunch of other things as well. You know, working out from home, exercising at home is nothing new to us. Uh, but that being said, most pieces of gym equipment that get purchased historically just end up sitting in a garage collecting dust, right? 
And that's because fitness has historically been a real in-person experience. But recently, brands like Peloton have taken that experience and brought it into your home. So they didn't reinvent. And again, this is like what Uber did and a lot of other brands. They didn't reinvent the spin bike. They just reinvented the experience of the spin bike at home. Just like how Uber didn't reinvent taxi transportation. They just reinvented the experience of getting from point A to point B. All right. So with with that being said, companies like Peloton, Miro, there's, there's a few others out there. And that pivot to in-person classes, live streaming at home, was there a strategy of mind body you know, before the, the layoffs to deal with or already into pivot to this kind of shift in in home experiences? Yes. Um, at mind body, we always thought, and they, they are still a, they stay, they very, they, they still believe very strongly that that in-person experience of people going into a studio or a gym is never going to go away because we need that social connection and we enjoy that. That's part of the, uh, that's part of the experience. So some of the numbers we were seeing was that people using Peloton were not going into that experience, looking into replace the, the in-person experience. So people research was showing that people were doing both. It was kind of a, um, an additional experience purchasing your bike. And if it was raining and you were feeling lazy, then you would jump on your bike and, 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 and jump into the app and, and do a, a session. Uh, but my body understood that there was a, and, and still understands that there's a massive uh, benefit of offering or being able to provide customers the, the option of offering online classes. And they were actually working on a video product. Um, that was due to be released in August 2020. That was the initial plan. Um, but when the crisis arrived and we were presented with this um, situation where at the end of March, I'm talking here in Australia, end of March, it was actually the 23rd of March, the government uh, announced that all uh, indoor facility, facilities like gyms um, and restaurants and uh, Swimming pools and things like these had to be closed. They were they were not allowed to open their doors. In in a matter of twenty four hours, we had we moved from having this massive pool of customers, uh, getting people walking through their doors, to no customers being able to deliver their services. Mm -hmm. And then we saw all like a, a big majority of these customers adapting really quickly into delivering online options. And they were really scrappy, really innovative. Uh, they were using Instagram and Facebook Live to just, you know, put up a session on, on, on Instagram. Hey, we're going to jump online and at 5 p.m., let's say, uh, join us for this yoga session or this Pilates session or whatever. They were very, very scrappy, but they were making it like they, uh, it was actually quite impressive. And, and it's good to see that character in, 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 in the customer base when, when you see that, how they, they quickly react and adapt to, to change and advers adversity. Um, MindBody made the decision then that in, in order to support our customer base, it was important to move the release of that video product from April. And the product team made it their priority. And in a matter of a month, they were able to roll out a beta, a beta a, a product that, and they put it in their hands of, of, of the clients for free. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, yes, there is a massive opportunity. Uh, I believe that the industry is going to move. It was already moving in this direction. And one of the things that the crisis has done, not only in this trend, but in multiple trends that we've seen in, in last five or six years, the crisis just accelerated the pace in which businesses and people are adapting to trends. And this is just one of them. Mm, yeah. I think that the, the tech itself and the delivery of the technology, which is part of the marketing strategy is also a huge reason why things become so popular. There was no reason why before Peloton, I couldn't just have my spin bike, my old 
you know, 200 dollars spin bike, no bells and whistles, sit in front of my TV, which is what I do now, um, because I didn't want to spend all the money on Peloton and the subscription, <laughs> yeah. and go onto YouTube and find a spin class that was pre-recorded. Because ultimately, in my logical brain, I'm getting the same workout. Maybe it's not yep. the same experience because I don't have all the the analytics of my my heart rate and and all that coming up on the screen and being tagged to my account and seeing you know if I'm going faster than someone else in the class that could be anywhere in the world. That's really cool. So I think yep. that that that's that's a differentiator because people look for differentiators in fitness. They look for that well that extra piece of reason to give them motivation to go out and buy that and go do that rather than, ah, it's a spin bike, you got to put it in front of the TV. But if it's this shiny new thing that you spend a lot of money on, it makes you want to use it because you feel guilty if you don't. Yeah, I think it's that. But as you were saying before, I think the experience is everything. Uh, the part and and the experience in, in the case of Peloton comes together with the sense of community, right? So you know that when you're jumping in these um in this class you are you're not the only one there you're jumping in a class together with not all the time but together with another 40 or 50 people and you can communicate with this and there is this sense of community and there you feel this change this sense of being challenged by a person that's virtually next to you and you can see that data like real time so that that helps trends like this grow um and, and especially, like, I, I listened to a podcast not so long ago about the story of Peloton and and how it was created by the I, I can't remember the name of the of the CEO, but he had no experience in 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 the fitness industry. He had no experience in technology. He he just had this crazy idea, and he was told no by many investors, and he was like, "That's never going to pick up. People can people like going to the gym." But I think going back to the way he's, he understood the change of people's behavior and how community and experience was so important and how people, because Peloton in, in, in the case of Peloton, it's, it's catered for people that don't have a lot of time in their hands, right? So they just have 30 minutes when they get back from work or before they go, they leave their, their home to work. Just those 30 minutes that are like prizes, they just jump on the bike, they quickly work out and then they leave. So understanding that market, who you're talking to, what the pain point is, and how you can solve that problem in the case of Peloton, they just nailed it. Um, and again, it sounds kind of, yeah, it can be replaced with your stationary bike and yeah. uh, uh, a video on YouTube. But yeah, it's just it's just the whole package that makes it stand out. It's not much different to when MP, MP3 players came out and then the iPod came out. It's the same thing, but it was branded different, differently. And Steve Jobs went on stage and said something like, a thousand songs in your pocket. He didn't say like, yeah. 256 megabytes of storage. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It was, it, it, but it's the same thing. I, I had an MP3 player before iPods came out, it was this shitty little thing with a one AA battery in the back and it, you know, it would last like, <laughs> one hour <laughs> run out and, and it was 128 exactly. meg, but yeah, it's, a, it's the same thing, right? These things exist. It's just uh, a rethinking and reshaping how you're delivering it, how you're marketing it um, and how the experience um, is. What is, what is the value that it brings to the user? So exactly. it's, it's that thousand songs. I don't care about how much like in, in, in my brain, I, I don't really care about the number of, storage capacity it's how many songs i can put in my pocket in back to your to your example so it's it's communicating the value to the user yep convenience as well just knowing that you can <laughs> register for for a peloton class get on get the workout in it's done and it yeah it's super simple and i think that is what people need everyone's busy um and everyone wants to get in and out of the gym. Most people don't like Absolutely. working out. Absolutely. And I, that's, that's why I believe this is, and like, look, I'm, I'm saying this not as a guru because it's, it's out there. Like there is enough proof that online fitness classes are just 
booming, not only because of COVID-19, but they are going to continue to boom after. Uh, and it makes sense. It makes sense for users. It makes sense for businesses, right? Uh, instead of having massive retail spaces, um, uh, well, not well, retail in some cases, but just uh, gym spaces or studio spaces. Um, you can have half of your business model could be online. You get the same revenue coming in. Um, and you don't need to have all these people coming in into your gym uh, or into your studio for an experience. You can deliver that online and that reduces the cost of servicing those those customers. So out of these in the in, in the in the fitness industry, unfortunately, I I think a lot of businesses are not gonna make it. Um, and not only in fitness, in, in many other industries, they're just not gonna make it, unfortunately. But the ones that are going to come on the other side uh, alive, we're going to see massive changes in business models um, just because it's, it, it, it makes sense. And, and we're going to see the same in the workforce in general. Be, be, businesses are going to let their, their employees work. And I'm shifting completely conversations, but it's just, just this mentality of we need to have people under everyone under one roof to make things work. That concept is going to go away. Uh, after COVID-19. Yeah, I think there's still going to be some functions within a company uh, that will require, you know, butts in seats. And, and it, especially yeah. I'm thinking like junior sales teams, you know, the people that are like a couple of years out of university who need that men mentorship and that mentoring, that yeah. coaching there and they need that team vibe. Mm. Um, but absolutely. I think there's so many functions, especially within marketing operations, finance, even legal that, that there's no reason why they can't all be done from home. I think a lot of people uh, I'm in San Francisco, a lot of people in the Bay area paying just crazy amounts of rent here are now thinking to themselves, Hmm, if I could do this work from home thing and my company's open to it, could I get out of San Francisco? Could I get out of California? Could I go work from Texas and not pay state tax and pay half the rent for a yep. place that's double the size? Like these are conversations that I'm having with my friends right now. And yep. um, it's it, a lot of people, I'm reading articles of people thinking about this. So I, I think millennials, especially in the Bay area who you have to be a multimillionaire to afford a house here. Um, the ones that want to settle down yeah. and have kids and and, ha and buy a house, you, you can't do it here. But I think this shift uh, to work from home and this forced global experiment of working from home is going to open up the doors to a, a lot of people to be able to own mm. a house and work on their savings and, and not waste money on huge rents. And huge rents and, and commuting. Yeah, it's it's going to be it's going to be a different world for many as we um walk out of this crisis hopefully in a good way unfortunately for for many it means losing their jobs like for example for me i'm in a in a good position because i had good savings and i uh, uh i i luckily i have a good some a good resume and i can jump to another uh, to another job and the situation in australia is not as bad as it is in the us in terms of unemployment at the moment um but yeah look it's um I, I think it's we are in a position right now where prices like these can mean just like sitting down and dwelling and thinking about all the bad things that can happen, or you can look go out and look for a new lifestyle, new options. Uh, what is that thing that you've always wanted to do? Um, and I uh, like. You've probably hear, heard or read this. Um, it's kind of been quite of a trendy topic right now, but a lot of companies came out of um, the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, it's it's a time for reinvention. So uh, I think people are people that see this period like that in a positive way um, have a better option of uh, moving away from this in in a in a good position. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of reinvention, uh, a lot of companies had planned out their schedule of events for 2020 and a ton of in-person events. I know Adobe had and a lot of, a lot of customers 
uh, in the marketing uh, industry that I've been talking to had tons of events that they had to cancel. And they're, mm. they're pivoting their strategy now to virtual events. So my question to you is how does a marketing organization go about reallocating budget from canceled in-person events and pivoting to a virtual event strategy? Mm. Um, look, it is, we've seen, I've seen everything in the last uh, two months. Um, I've seen companies just cancel their events, period, not even considering the idea of running them online. Um, they have, they've had the reasons and, and this is quite a generic conversation because each company has like, it depends on the industry there are at what, who are they talking to? What, why are they putting events together? Uh, what is the outcome that they want of, out of a specific enga- engagement? But I've also seen businesses like big businesses like Adobe and, um, Salesforce and, and Amazon, AWS it had the massive online event this week and they had to pivot what they were thinking to deliver face to face into online events in a matter of weeks, which is quite impressive. Um, when it comes, when, when, when I talk about reallocating budgets, I try to always go back and think, what is it that we are trying to achieve with the money that we were thinking about spending? If you are in the position of continue to sell the product that you were selling before COVID-19 and COVID-19 doesn't affect the, your sales cycles or the potential delivery of the product, then marketing budgets don't really need to be reallocated. What needs to change is the messaging so that you don't sound as a business, you don't sound deaf tone or out of touch. Your ads need to change. Your emails and your automations need to change to make sure that customers understand that you are empathetic and you understand that there's a crisis. And although you can continue to sell, you understand as a business that there's a crisis and that you're there to help. But business as usual is not a problem for your business. If you continue, if you're in a position where your product is, is um relevant during these times if you are in an industry where for example like travel or tourism at the moment where it is just impossible to to be um profitable at the moment then shifting budgets should be you need to more you need more than shifting budgets you you as a business you need to completely rethink your business models and i saw that in, in fitness a lot, um, given that they were not able to open their doors for many, many weeks, then, then I think that the conversations inside of business need to be more bigger than where do I allocate my marketing dollars? That's part of it. And I'll get there, but businesses need to think bigger. And it's like, okay, I, there's no way I can continue to sell my products. Uh, changing messaging won't, won't do it. I need to rethink my whole strategy and. Um, I think a good example is, for example, here in Australia, restaurants were still open. Like, people were not able to sit down and have their meals at restaurants, but you could order online or by, or on the phone and then go pick up your order or get it delivered. So if you were not in Uber Eats or Dashdoor or any of these delivery uh, platforms, then it was a perfect opportunity for your restaurant to rethink your business model have your kitchen open and build your, your business model around a delivery service. And we saw a lot of businesses do that. Um, in the fitness industry, uh, again, we saw businesses pivoting their, their business model in a matter of, of 24 hours, 48 hours, where they actually started renting their, their equipment, for example. One of our biggest clients, a, uh, here in, in Australia, um, Flow Athletic, um, posted a Instagram post saying, Hey, we're renting all our bikes. Going back to the Peloton example, we're renting all our bikes. Common. Actually, they didn't rent them. They just give them, they just let, let them away for free. So come pick up your bike, uh, take them home with you and we'll be, st- we're going to start delivering online sessions, um, next week. This was, back in, in late April, uh, March. 
So that ability of pivoting quickly, being being a, a having that mentality of adapting quickly and, and shifting your business model is key. And then your marketing dollars, going back to the, to the marketing question is how, how then you start spending, putting those dollars and aligning, aligning the messaging to what your new business model looks like. I'm going to go back to my body because I was there during the, during the crisis or the, the initial periods of the crisis. And I can t- give you a little bit of, of, um, a insight into how we alloc- reallocated dollars in a company that again moved from having a massive customer base of, of, of profitable clients into a, a, a clients that were not able to open their doors. So what we, what we did was we very quickly understood that we were not going to be able to sell any more software for, although we did, and it was, it was super impressive by the sales team. They were still coming. There were still deals coming through. The messaging was different. We were talking about, we were talking to businesses about, Hey, we're bringing this on. From a marketing perspective, what we did is we very quickly understood that we needed to become this voice of advice and experience helping our customers go through this crisis. We knew they were going online. We knew they were investing in capabilities, in online capabilities to be able to deliver online sessions. So our the biggest chunk of our budget moved, moved into creating content to communicate this. So we created daily blogs, articles, case case studies, uh, and, and, and we uh, amplify stories of businesses that were able to shift online in a matter of, of days. Um, and we share this with our community, with our client base. We say like this, this is how this business in Melbourne or in London or in the U S moved from their, their business model online in a matter of days. And these are the things you need to be considering. Um, for us, it was super important to invest in content, um, because People were looking for advice. People were looking for for um, that voice of direction, right? And, and we moved away from events. All the events that we had in our calendar, we completely, we said no. We just were not interested in, in acquiring new customers. For us, the priority was retaining our existing customers, showing them the value of the software that they invested uh, before and showing them that we were there to support them, to guide them and to help them go through the crisis and help them get to the other side alive, which is what they were really concerned about. Uh, they were thinking about, Hey, how we can continue to make cash? How do we, how I'm going to pay rent this week? That's, that's the things that they were thinking about at, and they're still thinking about right now. So the more content that we put out there supporting them and getting them uh, into the right resources um, so they could, uh, for, and as an example, we we were very, very vocal and uh, in, in helping them get uh, government re, um, funding. So governments around the world are putting funding to help SMBs. This is the side where you can go and do it. And here are the steps that you need to take into to apply for that for that uh, relief. So we, we, we became that and that's where our marketing shift, our marketing shift and where we reallocated our, our dollars. Yep. So you mentioned earlier that brands have to show compassion in a time like this. And it feels like we've all received like a hundred emails from CEOs of every company that we've dealt with ever. Um, with this, you know, heartfelt message of here's what we're doing and here's our response and we're here for you and, and all, all the, you know, everyone's the same email basically. And there's actually a video going around. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but it's the TV commercial. It's like a mashup of all different companies TV ad and it's the same thing and it's like they use no, the same I words. Seen it. <laughs> it's, I'll send it to you after this, but it's really interesting to see that 
it, it all begins with like this slow piano music and it's almost yeah. the same guy as strip. And, and at, at some point, those become disingenuous, right? When you've seen 10 of them, you're like, this is the same, same thing. And people aren't stupid. So what does a company do to show that we're a company with compassion? We do care about our customers, but without coming across as a corporate robot, you know, AI built co- commercial because yeah. Yeah. once you see a bunch of them, the human mind says BS and that's detrimental to the brand. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's only going to put you in a bad situation and people will always remember, remember that. So that's, that's a very interesting one. And I think this is the, this is where brands really struggle. There are a number of uh, articles and research being done at the moment about what customers expect from brands. Uh, in moments like this and four things always stand out. The first one is how are brands protecting their employees? So even if I don't work for Apple, let's say, if I, as a consumer of Apple, I love Apple, I have a Mac, I have an iPhone and I've always been, if I see how they're respecting and protecting their employees in moments like this, that creates, creates van brand value me it makes me respect that brand and it takes the brand from from talking to actually walking the mm-hmm. talk and you know it's like it's showing example and doing showing that example by doing what they are supposed to be doing in moments like this so that's that's the one that's number 1 number 2 is helping their communities uh, i think mind body was fantastic at doing this um is all right we understand that we're in a crisis right now we understand that we're not going to be able to sell to sell the products that we're currently selling our revenue is not going to be anywhere close to last year's revenue we understand that how we can help our community and and i think my body was really good at doing this and rolling up their sleeves and going in deep and supporting as much as possible and that's that's the second big thing that brands can do. And there are multiple examples of this. The third one connected to kind of touching to your example about emails coming through everyone's inbox from multiple brands is just don't sell to me. This is not a period to sell unless you're selling something that is relevant for this period of time. If you're Netflix and I'm staying at home and I'm consuming Netflix as crazy and I'm not a Netflix, sorry, if, if I'm a Netflix customer, but I'm stuck at home, Netflix, like, I understand that there's an opportunity there for Netflix to grow their, their customer base. And I'm yeah. probably more keen to getting on, on a subscription with them, right? So you need to understand who you are and who you're talking to and what people are feeling at this stage and what they're vulnerable, uh, what they want to hear and what they want, they, they, they want, don't want to hear. Um, and then the fourth, the, the last bit, the, the fourth topic that normally comes up in conversations like this is people actually want to keep communicating with brands. I don't mind you contacting me with a message and as long as it is relevant and it is authentic. There is a, there is a, um, in, during crises like this, the line, there's a very, very fine line between opportunity and opportunism and brands need to understand that the fact that you people are staying at home and probably consuming more media that's an opportunity right so if you're in the media business and like a netflix example again then that's an opportunity for you to grow your revenue and because people are actually in a position to consume more media but if you're a brand, again, let's go back to the to the to the example of of travel or tourism. It's it's just not the right time to be communicating about your cruise ships experience in 2020 because it just sounds like you don't understand the situation right now. And and we've seen, although although there uh, there's been news about uh, people buying cruise ships for 2021. 
it it still sounds <laughs> on depth. It it's it sounds like brands don't understand the situation and and they're thinking more about how they're gonna make money in the future than how to help communities and their customer base right right now. So I f- I feel like understanding that fine line between opportunity and opportunism in periods like this it's critical for for brands and. You just need to listen to your customers. Like there is, there is a, the, the way to avoid falling into, into those mistakes is just go on social media, uh, get your sales teams to call customers and not sell, but listen to them. What, what are they struggling with? How they, how, how your brand can help in periods like this and, and actually do that. Don't be vocal about it. Don't put a, Five million dollar TV ad about how your brand is dealing with COVID nineteen. Just use your PR agency to help that, like spread that message in a more organic way, so that it doesn't feel like you are pushing the message in the face of everyone. But people are reading that on social media, and it comes as one of those good, feel good stories on on LinkedIn or or on Facebook. So. It's, it's a fine balance between doing good and, but don't being so vocal about it that you need to actually show off. It's just, yeah, we're doing good and people will notice. People will know because, because it, it, it will come up somewhere in a conversation or in social media, uh, or in, or in the news. Yeah. I think another challenge is brands being relatable to, the broad spectrum of consumers it's impossible right because when you're when you're sending out a message to a whole customer base with a ceo email that's risky because you 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 know you don't have a specific demographic you're targeting it's just everyone that's ever bought from you it's coming from a ceo and the ceo is like one of the most unrelatable figures of a company because Generally, a CEO is like an old white guy, and <laughs> yeah, that's just not relatable to a lot of people yeah. um, that are receiving this email. And I, I think that car manufacturers were one of the first big brands to get on TV and start doing the the slow piano music with the shots of the yeah. cars driving around and saying like, "Nissan, where we've always been here for you." And I'm like. No, you haven't. Like, what does that mean? First of all, yeah. And and sixty percent uh, or sixty months interest free for a new car. And I'm like, I don't. I would never buy Nissan because this is a silly ad. And but that's how, that's how fickle consumers can be. So it's a it's risky, right? How do you message compassion without coming across as back to my original point disingenuous? I. Consumers are super smart. Like we all are consumers and we know that we've, we've got to this point where we can read the bullshit through anything, right? Uh, especially if with, when it comes from big brands that, uh, uh, example with car manufacturers, you just know that there is nothing, there is nothing, there, there is zero empathy in the way they communicate. Is, is, is not, is not, is not a lot about compassion. It's more about empathy. Um, so if, if we go back to that example, they, brands like that would do better in going back to their databases and say, saying, okay, let's, let's, uh, instead of putting a million dollar ad on, on national TV, why don't we communicate on a one, two, two specific segments in their, in their database with a message that actually resonates to them. So if you own a car and you're paying a, you're still paying your car, right? Um, how we can communicate a specific message to you to help you know that we're, we, we're putting some uh, measures in place so you don't have to pay your, uh, your, uh, monthly, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, payment. Your payments, your monthly payments. How are mm-hmm. we going to support you with that? Except, and it's just, it's just a specific message to a specific segment of people who 
are struggling right now because they might have lost their jobs. Um, so that that says more than a multi-million dollar TV ad on national television. Yeah, it's easy for me to really be critical good ex- at this point too because a lot of these companies had to do something in the first few weeks and they didn't know how it was going to come across um, and you know, they didn't realize at the time that every, every other company, maybe they all use the same agency or the same you know, the age, all the agencies are probably thinking the same thing too. Oh, let's, let's say we're here for you. And then the marketing team is just going to go with them. The PR team is going to say, that's great. But when it comes across weeks after, like, oh, that was probably not the best message for us to send out. It's a learning experience, right? So it's easy for me to be critical. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the, that's one of the things that we're going to learn out of these crisis, right, is when when we find ourselves in this situation in years to come, hopefully, um, I don't know if, if we're going to um, be in, in a position like this, uh, hopefully not in, in anytime soon. I hope many marketing uh, leaders will look back and say, hey, we, we really messed up last time, how we can be more empathetic and and generate more trust within our customers um, because people can definitely read through that. And like you said before, people will remember forever when a brand is ex- excellent at delivering and, and reacting to situations like this. And also when they're terrible at reacting at, at situations like this. Unfortunately, as consumers, we tend to remember more when brands are really, really shit <laughs> and when they make mistakes than when they do good and and when they're professional about things like this but we remember both um so yeah for 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 the future hopefully will brands will will get some lessons and 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 do better yeah we're uh we're both big sports fans um so it's great to see the bundesliga returning in germany this weekend so uh, football, as you know, it's such a experience driven sport, especially from your home country in Colombia as a fan, as a player, the passion behind it, the atmosphere of going to a game and, and even at a lower scale in Australia, depending on, you know, what, which team you're going to, to go support or see. Uh, the Bundesliga is known to be one of the more fan friendly leagues in the world. How do sporty organizations leverage modern marketing, digital trends, technology to deliver an exceptional experience to fans who will be watching at home? We're going to have empty stadiums. There, there must be technology in the works. You think AI technology, you think AR, you think any type of VR headset. These are things that companies and uh, sporting organizations played around with a few years ago, but it never really got mainstream. Yeah. So what are some things that a, a Bundesliga or the Premier League when it comes back can start working on or start thinking about to try to bring that experience into the homes of a mm. supporter that goes beyond just 4K, IDF, good commentary, yeah, good camera work. Yeah. Um, look, I that's a that's a big question, and there is, in my personal opinion, is that it, it's this is gonna be more than just the experience is more than just a game. Um, so community engagement and look, talking back to communities or fan engagement in in this in this uh, case it's going to be a 24/7 um experience right so how how do you keep fan engaged even when players are not on the field and that's one of the things that uh, a lot of um sports and clubs uh, are working on at the moment and they've been doing a lot of uh, let's say a lot of they've, they've been thinking for a, 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 lo- a long time um, so it touches different industries uh, and it touches a lot different technologies and um, what I've what I've seen recently uh, grow is 
electronic sports and clubs investing in esports. And so most of the major leagues and, and clubs now have uh, e electronic sports representatives that play for their teams, which is a massive industry right now. And fans, like traditional football fans, are moving into that as well. So, for example, now that what what um, now that we're in in the middle of COVID nineteen and all the football leagues, like you said, are paused. Um, what the EPL did is they created this um, EPL Invitational tournament where some of their major players played for their teams on a a tournament. Yeah, uh, I, FIFA I saw tournament. that online. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's incredible the number of people that came on board and watch the tournament, uh, as it was, it, it, I, it, they've done it twice now over two weekends. And you can tell not that you need this approval because electronic sports has been growing for the last couple of years in massive rates, but the last one is the last invitational uh, tournament that did it was last weekend. They had 150 million viewers globally and it was streamed online on Sky Sports and BBC. And the final of the, the, the last game was um, a, actually a, streamed a, on Sky Sports on, on live television. So, so you can, you can, you can now see how big it is and how, where we, where this is going. Mm -hmm. Um, another big industry that it touches is, uh, in, in, well, not industry, but like uh, a technology that it touches is VR and AR. Like you said before, I've seen in the NBA, uh, in, in La Liga in Spain, I've seen people now using VR sets, VR head, VR headsets and actually attending line games live, like not in the stadium, but from their homes. I think this is still early, um, because you need a, you need high quality and your cameras all, all like across the stadium to make sure that you capture every angle of the game and make it in as immersive as possible. This is still early, but it's going to grow. And there are a lot of companies investing in, in this at the moment. So I, NBA, I think it's a good example of how, because courts are smaller and it's, I, I think it's, it's easier to grasp the action of the game. Uh, you don't, it's, it's not as big. Um, I know NBA has been investing in these for, for years now and you can actually buy tickets. There are some games where you can buy tickets and, and, and see the match from your, from your, um, uh, living room with a VR headset. That's only going to grow. De definitely. Again, going back to our conversation around how business models need to change and um, sports. Uh, clubs understand that they need to move away from face to face delivery and people are gonna only gonna adapt and start consuming sports from the living room. They've, we've always done that. We've always done that, but in different ways, right? We've, like you said, we've only seen it by our TV. It's going to be via headsets now. Yep. Another really cool thing that I saw that I saw a couple of months ago was artificial, sorry, um, augmented reality. And it's a table, um, where, and then you, 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 where your, your head's set and you can actually see a projection of a football game on 3D on top of a table. Um, wow. it's quite crazy. Yeah. But that's where we're going. And that's, it's going to take some years to develop the technology so you can actually, and the cool thing is that you can stand around the table with your mates and you see the players. Obviously, it's 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 a uh, it's um a, it's it's virtual, right? But you can see the players running and the ball going. It's it's just crazy. Um, that's high tech. It's still in the works. But what brands are doing today that's getting a lot of engagement is how to continue to engage their fans twenty four seven with things like fantasy leagues, uh, getting cameras inside training sessions. Instagram and Facebook and all the social platforms are great at doing this. Uh, so you have a social media manager for, let's say, Manchester City just before the game, going through the, through the locker rooms and interviewing players like, Hey, are you ready for the game? Tell us what's happening. We just arrived to the stadium. The team is 
is prepping. So getting getting the experience to be larger than the, you know, I'm using an, a football example, like the 90 minutes of a, of a soccer match or a football match, that's where brands need to capitalize. It's the experience is larger than those 90 minutes and it's larger than just being on the stadium. So there's a lot of things happening there and it's quite exciting. That's, that's something that I'm really looking forward to, to uh, learn more about and, and kind of be part of that growth. The sports that make the first comebacks, I think, are going to have an opportunity to capture new fans. So that the diehard NBA fan that is just missing you know, live sports, they crave live sports right now, they may put on a game of from, from the Bundesliga this weekend and, and catch you know, Bayern Munich playing. They may watch the UFC fight on this Saturday night, you know, UFC's back doing live events. Yep. Is there an opportunity for, for a, a football organization, the UFC to capture new fans from other organizations that are not ready to come back yet? I think so. Um, yeah, absolutely. Why not? And the, one of the things about sport fans is that we are sport fans, right? We, when you are truly a sport fan, you appreciate every sport. You, you appreciate that they're different. Um, but once you understand the rules of a sport that you've never experienced before, you, you're like, oh, okay, this makes sense. I understand why uh, NBA fans are so passionate at NBA because, because it's that competitiveness, that passion about, um, supporting one specific team that is kind of the underlying uh, theme of all sport fans. We all feel the same, just in different sports. So I think so. I think so that there's there's that opportunity for, for different sports to capture fans that are not still in, in, in like looking or watching your sport. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, we've, we've touched on a lot of really interesting topics today. I'm super excited to see where some of these professional sporting organizations take it with technology and things like AR and VR. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens next year, 2021. Hopefully things are back to normal by then. There's a vaccine out. It's going to be cool to see what some of the big brands <laughs> yeah. are doing and how they reinvent themselves. Um, like a lot of big companies had to reinvent themselves after the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Uh, but Harada, really appreciate the time today. Great chatting with you. Um, anything that you wanted to plug at the end or if anyone has any questions for you, where can they find you and reach out? Uh, I think LinkedIn is the best one to, to reach out if, if you have any questions. I'm, I agree with you. It's going to be super interesting to see where we are in let's say 12 months time in terms of business models um that, like i said at the beginning all this crisis everything that is done is accelerate the pace of change and bring like make companies adapt faster to some trends that we were seeing before so things like digital transformation um we've talked about it because it's one of the big themes that Adobe and we like you, you support businesses in that digital transformation journey. Um, that's just going to grow immensely because now brands, now that they've gone through this, they un really understand why it is so important to be digitally, uh, prepared always. Um, so uh, things like sustain sustainability is another one. I think brands are going to be a little bit more. Uh, conscious about uh, their uh, sustainable um, efforts, so that's that's another one. I hopefully we'll, we'll see more of that in next year. And then the last one is just trust. I think trust is key right now. Customers are gonna go out there, and because some of our behavior is changed after this, we're gonna be looking to partners and brands that we can partner with. The first thing that we're going to ask is for trust and authenticity and brands that deliver these are going to be top of mind, no doubt. So 
curious, curious to see what next year is going to look, where brands are going to be next year and um, how this crisis uh, is going to make brands look next year. Yeah. Well, I really enjoyed the conversation. I will tag uh, Gerardo in the post uh, on LinkedIn and also on YouTube. So if anyone has any questions for him, you can send him an email, send him a connection request, and I'm sure he'll be more than happy to reply to you. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for your time, Thanks, Gerardo. See you, mate. Yep.